Hello and happy Wednesday to everyone. Welcome to our briefing, Key Findings from the Newest Global Assessment Report on Climate Change. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. And more recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing and beneficial electrification programs for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. If you would like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a moment to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. The latest issue just came out yesterday. The crispness in the air, the crunch of leaves, the harvest moon illuminating the night sky, you can feel it in the air, you know what time it is. My friends, welcome once again to what we at EESI call Coptober. Is that just a clumsy portmanteau of COP27 in October? You bet it is but it's also so much more. Today is the start of a four-part briefing series that will continue until the start of the International Climate Negotiations, the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP27, in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, beginning in early November. These briefings and our other key resources, most notably our daily newsletter, COP27 Dispatch, are designed to help congressional staff quickly get up to speed on the negotiations, which will be front page news for two weeks, and follow the proceedings from start to finish. President Biden is planning to attend, and so is a delegation of members of Congress, as well as key congressional staff. We will be using these briefings, and especially the one about natural climate solutions, and the one called What's on the Table for Negotiations Briefings, to explore how investments in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inf Inflation Reduction Act will contribute to the U.S. meeting its Paris Agreement climate goals. And also, what remains to be done to reach the target of a little more than 50% greenhouse gas reductions by 2030, as well as to help other countries meet their goals. We start today with a look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report, the Sixth Assessment Report, and its relevance for COP27 and ongoing work on Capitol Hill. The IPCC assessment reports are designed to pull together information from around the globe on climate change, including on the physical science, climate impacts and adaptation, and possible greenhouse gas emission trajectories and mitigation opportunities. Our panelists today have all participated in drafting and reviewing sections of the report. Next Thursday, we will cover loss and damage, in other words, climate impacts that cannot be adapted to, a topic that is expected to be among the most discussed at COP27. Following that, ESI will partner with, the, with U.S. Nature for Climate for a briefing about natural climate solutions, a potential area for bipartisan U.S. leadership and of special relevance to the 2023 Farm Bill in the works. And finally, just before COP27, we will take a step back and look out over all the issues on the table for the negotiations and how the international community could proceed toward meeting the challenge of global climate change. That is a lot to keep up with, I know that. If you're not subscribed to ESI newsletters, Climate Change Solutions, or COP27 Dispatch, please take a moment to visit us online at www.eesi.org forward slash subscribe to sign up. It really is the best way to keep up with everything. We have four amazing panelists, and before I introduce them, let me remind everyone that we will have some time today for questions, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience. If you have a question, you have two options to send it to us. First, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at eesi.org, or even better, follow us online at ESI Online uh, on Twitter and send it to us that way. It's my privilege to introduce the first of our four panelists today. Dr. Ram Ramaswamy is the director of NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Since 1992, Ram has been a lead author, coordinating lead author, or review editor for each of the major assessment reports of the International or Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. He's also been a coordinating lead author on the World Meteorological Association Assessments on Stratospheric Ozone and Climate, and on the first U.S. Climate Change Science Program, Global, uh, Global Change Research Program uh, Assessment. 
Uh, he's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Ron has also been involved in the leadership of the U.S. Global Change Research Program's Interagency Group on Integrative Modeling and the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Program. Uh, Ram, welcome to our briefing today. I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. And can you hear me? Yes, hear you just fine. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, at least on the East Coast, and a good day to everyone uh, who's outside of the East Coast. Um, I was a review editor of uh, Chapter 7 on the latest IPCC report, Working Group 1, and I'd like to talk about some of the uh, results and uh, significance of those results uh, from that report. Uh, and this, the Working Group 1 deals with a physical science basis, so it lays the scientific basis for the uh, outcomes that are then mentioned in Working Groups 2 and 3. Next slide, please. So just to, to kind of just go into an introduction uh, about the organization, the IPCC. The IPCC was formed uh, by World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. Uh, it consists of a plenary, which is really all the countries. Um, and then below that is an IPCC bureau, which kind of really does the administration of the IPCC. And then below that is the executive committee, which takes up uh, matters on a on a day-to-day -day basis. There are three working groups, working group one, two, and three. Uh, I'm going to talk about mainly the working group one, and then you're going to hear about two and three by the speakers coming up later. And then there's a task force of national greenhouse gas inventories, which is also part of the IPCC process. Each one of these groups has a technical support unit, TSU, and then come the authors, contributors, and reviewers who make up the report. Next slide, please. So just uh, again, a brief uh, look at the history of the IPCC assessment reports that evolved evolution. Uh, IPCC started in 1988. The first report came out in 1990 called the FAR. At the same time, we had the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change come up. Uh, then came the second assessment report at the time approximately of the Kyoto Protocol in 1995. The third assessment report with the focus on adaptation came out in 2001. Uh, fourth assessment report with, for the first time talking about the two degrees limit came up in uh, 2007. Uh, and then came the fifth assessment report AR5, which was followed by the Paris Agreement. And then came a series of uh, small reports, uh, short reports, one on the 1.5 degrees, SR15, uh, and then two short reports, SROCC, which was the Oceans and Cryosphere, and SRCCL, which was Climate Change and Land. And then we are here in the AR6 re regime now, with 2021 being when the Working Group 1 report was, one, one report came out, and that was then followed months later by Working Group 2, and, and then three. Next slide, please. So how is the report generated, just in a nutshell? So starting from the top left, uh, IPCC approves the outlines, which are formed by experts and all the countries participating. Uh, then the governmental governments and organizations nominate experts. Uh, the Bureau selects the authors uh, who are going to frame the chapters and write the chapters. The authors prepare the first order draft. And then at the bottom, you see expert review. That's the expert review of the first order draft. Then comes the second order draft, where the authors prepare the second order on the basis of comments received on the first order draft. And these comments are from worldwide experts and really anyone uh, who wants to comment. Um, then come, after the second order draft comes the expert review. Along with that comes the government reviews. It, it goes formally to all the governments. The authors then prepare the final draft in response to comments from the experts and governments. And then that, go that goes for the final distribution to the governments as well as to experts worldwide. And then comes the uh, approval of the summary for policymakers, SPM. Uh, and that's kind of individual for each working group. And then comes the publication of the reports. Again, each working group has its own report. Next slide, please. So uh, just going into the results, the observed change in global surface temperature, you see on the right hand side the observed, which is the modern instrument or record. And then going 2,000 years back, you see kind of proxy records. And basically, the, the key messages that the observations reveal the largest warming that's occurred is in the last 150 years. And in fact, this rivals or competes with the warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. Next slide, please. And so what is happening is the climate system is now out of energy balance. We know this from observations. 
as well as theoretical model uh, frameworks. Uh, a stable planet would have the same amount of energy going out of the planet than uh, compared to coming in, which is the solar energy. But now there is an imbalance, there's less energy going out. So the system is trapping energy, 91% of which is in the ocean. That's a sort of key point because the oceans are the biggest reservoirs of this heat surplus accumulating on the planet with a little bit of it in the land and also some locked up in the ice sheets. Next slide, please. So what is causing this out of balance thing? So if you just concentrate on the plot on the left hand side, uh, in the upper left, uh, all the positive values are due to the greenhouse gases. And there are some negative values too in the lower uh, part of the upper left panel, which indicates negative forcings or by forcing we mean something which, exi which is existing, exerting a perturbation. And the positives and negatives actually come out more in the, uh, are more overwhelmingly in the side of positives and that's kind of what leads the warming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think you went past one slide. Can you go back one slide? Yeah, thank you. So the human influence shown in the previous plot has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2000 years. And what you see are uh, simulations from models, and this is from all the models around the world. Um, and you look at the observed curve, which is sort of black line running uh, the warming in the year 2020, and that is well matched by the uh, of models, which are taken into account both human and natural forcings. If you if you had only the natural forcings, such as solar and volcano forcings, you don't reproduce that warming that's observed. So it's very clear that the human natural influences have been uh, exerting this influence on the global surface temperature. Next slide, please. And in looking at kind of what exactly is happening in terms of the various components perturbing the Earth's radiation balance. On the left-hand side is the observed warming in 2010 relative to pre-industrial. And on the right-hand side, you see a uh, uh, contribution by various sources. And the largest one, the, the, the sort of extreme left is a total human influence. And what you see is that is a res residual of a large warming due to greenhouse gases and small cooling, which is due to aerosols, basically. And that really then offset the aerosol offsetting somewhat the greenhouse warming, giving rise to the total warming that you see which reproduces the observed quite well. Next slide, please. And this is showing the regional influence. What is remarkable about this plot is, it's showing actually the different regions of the world um, and uh, where there's the populations and going from North America on the left, South America to the South, and then across the Atlantic to Europe, and then Asia, and then below you see Aust Australia, Africa. Everywhere it's a brown color, which means there's an increase of the temperatures. Uh, and the extremes. Um, and also you see the dots indicating medium to high confidence in most of these places. Very telling that this is the state of affairs that this IPCC assessment has found. Next slide, please. So what about the future? So the future is dominated by scenarios uh, where the technological and emission scenarios vary from really aggressive curbing of greenhouse gases to unabated uh, increases the greenhouse gases, which is shown, shown by CO2 on the left-hand side. And then the right side panel show uh, respectively methane on the top, nitrous oxide in the middle, and then aerosols at the bottom. So the, all the greenhouse gases really keep on increasing unless there are really uh, very tight controls on them. Uh, aerosols on the other hand, which were sort of the, causing a little bit of offset of the warming due to the cooling effects are actually all po postulated decrease primarily because of health considerations and air pollution uh, issues. Next slide, please. So the result of the scenarios as run by the world's climate models again and aggregated combined together gives you this picture. Uh, if you look at from 2015 onwards, uh, all increasing in temperature. Now a couple of scenarios which have aggressive uh, curves of the emissions do po uh, postulate a decrease in temperature in later years, but still it's an increase over pre-industrial. And then of course the most unabated scenario is the SSP 5, 8.5 which shows an increase of almost five degrees by 2100. And that is when there's really no curves on the emissions. Next slide, please. So now with every increment of global warming, changes get larger regionally in terms of temperature, precipitation, soil moisture. So the upper two uh, globe diagrams really represent the observed change and then simulated change at one degree centigrade global warming, respectively. That is, if the globe warmed by one degree, what would the regional changes look like? And then at the bottom, you see what would the globe look like uh, with simulated changes at 1.5 degree global warming from the left 
middle is two degrees and the extreme right is four degrees. What it's telling you is three things. One, land is warming faster than the oceans. Northern hemisphere is warming faster than the southern hemisphere. And then the polar uh, regions like the Arctic are warming really excessively compared to the rest of the regions of the globe. Next slide, please. Now, the human act activities are going to affect all the major climate system components. Some are going to respond over a few decades and others might take a century or more to respond. Here, this particular plot is showing the September Arctic sea ice extent. Um, and you can see that by 2060, most of the scenarios and actually a lot of the models are showing actually practically ice-free Arctic uh, in the summer. Uh, and as you go to 2100, there is much, much, much more shrinking of the sea ice area in the Arctic which has implications for, the, for example, the transarctic navigation and passages through the ice. Next slide, please. And the sea level rise. So again, the global warming is poised to increase the sea level rise, both because of the warming of the water expands the water and also the sea ice shrinking. Now there's one curve which you see as low likelihood high impact storyline. That is actually including something which is really Quite un, uh, not very certain right now, but the ice sheet instability. If the land ice sheets are un, become unstable, then you can have a sea level rise which is more than the one meter that is given by the most uh, unabated uh, scenario uh, listed here. So that's kind of a possibility that has been accounted for, but the exact uh, estimate is uh, still not very, it's not available because of a lot of uncertainties about the ice sheets, their dynamics. Next slide, please. And so with the uh, hot, uh, with the sort of warming, you have extremes. And what is, if you look at just the left-hand side of panel, you see what is hot temperature extremes over land. If in 1850, 1900, if we had a frequency of such warming one per 10 years, as you increase the temperature to one degree, 1 1.5, two degrees, four degrees, you're likely to now have uh, extremes three, four, five, six, or even 10 times. Uh, you know, by the time it reaches four degrees centigrade. And along with the frequency of this uh, occurrence of hot extremes, you also have the intensity increasing, uh, basically anywhere from two degrees to five degrees, depending upon what the global warming has been. And the next slide, please, shows the corresponding thing concerning precipitation. So heavy precipitation over land, if we think of it in terms of once in 10 year events, uh, the frequency will go up uh, as, as the earth warms, as the globe warms by two degrees, it'll go up by a factor of two. And more the warming, the more sort of the frequency goes up of occurrence every 10 years. And the intensity, namely how wet it's getting, also goes up by 10 to 15% uh, by the time you get to two degrees centigrade. And even more if it's uh, the warming, global warming is more than uh, two degrees centigrade. Next slide, please. So I'm coming to the uh, end of my presentation, and I just want to summarize using uh, the set of three slides. So the, the sort of punchlines from the, all the observations, modeling, analysis in the working to one report is that the recent changes that climate are widespread, they are rapid, they're intensifying, and they have been unprecedented in thousands of years. Next slide, please. And the, the causes of this are human influences. They are, uh, it's really disputable now, because of the wealth of observations and analysis and modeling that's gone on. It's indisputable that human activities are causing the climate change. They are also making for extreme climate events, such as heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, and making them more frequent and severe. And next slide, please. So climate change, uh, the global warming, and the climate change is already affecting every region on Earth. And it's actually affecting in multiple ways. Uh, what I've described is the more the changes on the physical climate side and shown and, and showing that the changes you experience will increase with further warming. And you'll see in the subsequent talks also how this is actually affecting uh, ecosystems and uh, other, uh, other, other things that relate to the physical climate system and are poised to get also severe as the climate gets more severe on the physical side. So with that, I will end my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ram. That was awesome. An excellent presentation. Um, Ram just presented some incredible slides. That's a good time to remind everyone that presentation materials will be available, will be available on 
uh, our website, www.esi.org. Um, we'll also have an archived webcast of the webinar uh, or our briefing today so that you can go back and watch it. Um, and it'll take us a little bit of time, but we'll get some written summary notes posted online too to help people um, sort of navigate um, the presentations without having to uh, watch the webcast if, in case that's more convenient. Our second panelist today is Dr. Deborah Lay. Uh, Deb is an Economic Affairs Officer at the Energy and Natural Resources Unit of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. She is lead author for the IPCC's Sixth Assessment Report Working Group 2, which is Impacts, Vulnerability, and Adaptation, and lead author of the IPCC's Special Report on Global Warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius, focusing on adaptation, sustainable development, and renewable energy. She has worked at Sandia National Laboratories in the U.S., and has been a consultant with numerous organizations focusing on topics of renewable energy, energy poverty, rural electrification, sustainable development, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, Deb is a volunteer with the Engineers Without Borders uh, and an editor of the Journal of Regional Environmental Change. Deb, welcome to our briefing today. Um, turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you for the whole team for this very kind invitation. Thank you for also the interest in IPCC's results. So as um, you have mentioned, Working Group 2 is on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and taking up from what Graham just mentioned, um, based on the different um, findings from Working Group 1, we can also see how impacts will continue to worsen, and in many cases, they will just be more um, frequent and intense, like, um, for example, the hurricane season. So next slide, please. Here we can see the number of species exposed to potentially dangerous climate conditions. And we can see the difference between the top um, left on 1.5 degrees C moving to two degrees C, three, and then and then four. And if we, I, it's important to look at this differentiation because if we look at the um, current emissions reductions commitments, we are at about, uh, at about three degrees C. So we can see the stark difference in the percentage of biodiversity exposed and that will potentially be lost. The next slide, please. Here we can see the global distribution of population exposed to hyperthermia. And again, um, at 1.5, um, there's a stark difference between the, the 1.5, 1.8, and then 2.5 degrees, where we can see that in some parts of the of the world we're at about 300 days of of exposure and where we can see that in parts of the of the us also the number of days increases next slide please so in general we can see um as the main future global climate risk that that, that heat stress the number of days under heat stress will increase water scarcity that at two degrees c regions relying on snow melt will experience approximately 20% decline in water availability, which will mainly affect agriculture and food security. Um, and then flood risk, where about a billion people in low-lying cities um, will be at increased um, flood risk. Next slide, please. But we also have to keep in mind the simultaneous extreme events and what we call um, compounding and cascading risk. And here we have an example of um, increasing heat and drought that on, on the one hand um, give the result of, of reduced crop yields, but on the other hand, increase heat stress among farm workers, which in turn um, reduces productivity. And they both combine to, for increased food prices, reducing household incomes. And we can see those effects going both locally and, and potentially um, global effects, especially with food security issues. Next slide, please. But what we also see is that worldwide, there are between 3.3 and 3.6 billion people living in places that are highly vulnerable to climate change. Next slide, please. And what we can see here is that it's not just because of climate risks. We also have to deal with systemic vulnerability. And this, these places face more vulnerability um, because there is a limited or lack of access to basic services and infrastructure. Most of their income sources are climate sensitive. They have high levels of poverty, unequal income distribution, poor governance or, or lack of governance and lack of financial resources. So we need to keep in mind that in addition to, to reducing climatic risk, 
even if this is significantly reduced or eliminated, there will be still some populations that have um, increased vulnerability. Next slide, please. Here we can see three different adaptation scenarios based on the level of adaptation and, and yeah, the level of, of, of funding and of implementation. And the um, examples are, are health-related, health-related morbidity and mortality, ozone-related mortality, malaria, and, and dengue and other vector-borne diseases. And the, this figure is what we call the burning embers, with white at the bottom, meaning that there are no visible impacts and moving on to darker colors where these systems will then become irreversible, irreversible and that adaptation will be less effective to no effective at all. So we can see, for example, in heat-related morbidity that with limited adaptation, um, there's, we're already at high risk if we stay between 1.5 degree and 2 degrees C, but with proactive adaptation, um, the risk decreases. So this is just, um, this is just one example chosen to show also the, the social inequities, but also the important role that adaptation can take to reduce these risks. Next slide, please. Um, but we also know that adaptation saves lives. It reduces risks. It has multiple benefits. And we also know that it is unequally implemented throughout, throughout the world. So there is still a um, an adaptation gap in, in all the regions of the, of the, of the world. And just um, to follow on um, RAM's um, map divided by regions, IPCC doesn't do assessments by country, but by regions. So we can see this adaptation gap happening in every single, single region. But despite that, we know that adaptation can be effective. We need to keep in mind, first of all, the limits to adaptation. And this is that as warming, levels continue to increase, the effectiveness of adaptation might, dec might decrease and that adaptation cannot prevent all losses and damages. And this is most evident in um, adaptation options based on water in which we can see that above, as we approach and exceed 1.5 degrees C of global warming, that, that effectiveness will decrease significantly. And this will affect mostly um, freshwater sources and also people living on small islands, those dependent on glaciers and, and, and snow melt. And as I mentioned before, significantly impacting food security. And next slide, please. The other channel, oh, sorry, the next slide. And that the other um, thing we need to focus on um, is maladaptation. And this is adaptation that has unintended consequences and exacerbates vulnerability, including shifting risks. And it's mainly due because we think in short terms or we think on immediate fixes without thinking of the potential consequences on other populations or ecosystems. And in many cases, because we don't account for um, the most vulnerable. Next slide, please. Based from the um, special report on global warming at 1.5 degrees C and the need to bring adaptation and mitigation together, we worked on a framework um, called system transitions in which we are better able to bring adaptation and mitigation um, and analyze their synergies and, and, and trade-offs, but also keeping in mind the relationship that you have between, one, between options and within the system. So that is that when we implement an adaptation option, we, we currently do it in isolation. This is one adaptation option. But that in reality, we need to look at how that adaptation options interact with other options. So here we have these five system transitions. Um, in working group two, we don't do um, industrial, that's more for um, working group three. And then since um, SR 1.5, we've added societal transitions. Next slide, please. So this figure is the, uh, we call it the multi-dimensional feasibility assessment done in SR 1.5, but also done in both working groups two and working group three, trying to step away from the focus that's usually technological and economic and going into institutional, social, um, environmental, and geophysical dimensions. And here we can see the bigger circles, meaning high feasibility, smaller circles, meaning low feasibility. But low circles don't mean that we can't work on that option. It means that we either have research gaps, there's not enough knowledge on it yet, 
or that there are significant barriers and that's where resources need to be invested you know where we need to do investment so from what we can see in this um slide is that uh, institutional the institutional dimension is the one that has the most low to medium um, feasibility and in this um, the second column of the circles you have the synergies with mitigation so we can also see you know how feasible is an adaptation option but how good does it reduce emissions or not in the next slide please here we can see the different um, some of the indicators we used, which of course change between the working groups. But I, I just want to put special attention to political acceptability, legal, legal and regulatory feasibility, institutional capacity, transparency, and then social co-benefits, mostly linking with the sustainable development goals, social cultural acceptability, inclusiveness issues, and then equity intergenerational and gender and of course other equity indicators can be added when there's enough evidence something really good to report on is that in sr 1.5 um, published in 2018 we didn't have enough um literature to report on gender equity but from 2018 till now we there, there was enough to to put it in but there, there's another important thing in this framework in that it is flexible. So this is done at the global level. In working group two, the different sectoral and regional chapters carried out their own feasibility assessments. And we can also see the change in indicators to what's important in, in those regions. So, you know, there are regions, for example, if you're working with Native Americans, you can include indigenous knowledge under social cultural you know, as a specific indicator. So just to show where the priorities are and also where we need to put more attention. Next slide, please. Here is just to give a closer look and if, where you can see that, for example, forest-based adaptation, agroforestry, biodiversity management, and ecosystem connectivity, and improved cropland management are options that have medium to high feasibility on adaptation, but also strong synergies with um, mitigation. And in the next slide, please. We can see some energy, um, some options for energy systems and in, in where for the first time energy comes more strongly, realizing the importance or the need for resilience and in energy infrastructure, but also realizing the importance of energy as a means for adaptation and how it enables other options. Next slide, please. Here, um, as part of the same feasibility assessment, we see the link to some of the main SDGs. And here we can highlight SDG 3 on health, 6 on water, and 11 on sustainable cities and communities as being cross-cutting across um, most of the, of the options. Next slide, please. So we know what works. We know what's feasible. We know what's effective. Um, what else can be done to accelerate adaptation? And first of all is political commitment. We also need strong institutional frameworks, robust and flexible institutions, enhancing knowledge, improved monitoring and evaluation, and inclusive governance that prioritizes equity and justice. Next slide, please. So something that Working Group 2 work, um, emphasizes a lot in this current report is the concept of climate resilient development. And this is um, going beyond what I just described in the feasibility and into how can we really bring together climate risk reduction, emissions reduction, interdependence with ecosystem, looking at SDGs and, and, and biodiversity, and how we can shift this societal development so next slide please here we can see one climate resilient development trajectory which um, leads to well-being low poverty ecosystem health equity and justice next slide and then the next trajectory which um, is the current development trajectory where adaptation gaps increase and we are on course to 3.2 degrees warming next slide and here we see a number of paths in between and pay special attention to the dotted line at the top, which means that these are trajectories that are lost to us, not available because of decision and actions we've taken in the past. Next slide, please. So how do we choose these trajectories? And this is where the importance of societal choices, how everybody in society can participate from government, private sector, civil society, working in numerous arenas listed here in the next slides like economic and financial next um knowledge and technology moving on to ecological and political and social cultural and community and community arenas 
Next slide, please. And then here with all this, we can see how we get development where we have a di um, knowledge diversity because we include more of you know diverse values and knowledge systems, especially indigenous knowledge, ecosystem stewardship, equity, justice, and inclusion. And on the other hand, we have the, the opposite. Next. So here in this figure, we bring it all together, seeing starting from the left-hand side of how you have all these actors and arenas participating and shaping the different pathways, the different trajectories um, we take. I think it is a, um, something um, worth mentioning is that working group two, this was the first time that indigenous knowledge was put at the same level as scientific knowledge. So I think that's, um, that was good, good, good progress. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to wrap up, some of the, just summarizing the key messages is that climate risks are appearing faster, will get more severe. And I think that's something that we've been able to see in the past years. That impacts cascade through natural and human systems, often compounding the impacts from other human activities, like in the example I showed of heat stress and, and agriculture and food security. Next slide, please. And then that for many locations on earth, options for adaptation are already limited and that we need to act in the next decade before we lose more pathways, before we, we reach limits in which more options of adaptation will be less effective. And that um, tied to this, the maintenance recovery, the effectiveness of adaptation options is, is tightly integrated with um, the achievement of mitigation targets. Next slide, please. And that the magnitude, um, of observed impacts and climate and projected climate risks also indicate the scale of the planning and funding needed, especially if we want to achieve climate resilient development because adaptation on its own is not enough and mitigation on its own is, is not enough. So um, we have a decade to act and get these transitions in place. Next slide, please. And the scientific evidence is unequivocal the, the risks are here and we have the tools to act. So right now what we provide here is the knowledge to make these decisions, but we also need the wisdom to make these ethical decisions, to not leave anybody behind and to incorporate the most marginalized and vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. And that should be the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that tremendous presentation. Um, uh, a quick reminder that uh, we've already, we're halfway through our program-ish and we've covered a ton of information. I know people in our online audience will have questions. If you have questions, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask at eesi.org. That's A-S-K at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at EESI online and send it to us that way. Um, we'll do our best to incorporate questions we receive from our online audience into the Q&A. And the Q&A will happen after uh, we hear from our final panelists. I'm going to introduce our next two panelists together because they will be sharing the presentation. Um, first up is Dr. Nan Jo. Nan is a senior scientist at Na Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, Nan has led many international programs at LBNL on energy efficiency and greenhouse gas mitigation, often focused on China. Nan is currently the technical program manager for the Net Zero World Action Center, an initiative launched by the US government to work with countries to implement their climate pledges and accelerate transitions to net zero, resilient and inclusive energy systems. In addition, she is a lead author on the chapter on mitigation and development pathways of the IPCC Working Group 3 Six Assessment Report on Mitigation of Climate Change. And her co-presenter will be Dr. Lynn Price, Lynn is an affiliate retired senior scientist in the energy technologies area of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Lynn's research is focused on energy efficiency and greenhouse gas mitigation with an emphasis on industrial applications, materials efficiency, and China. Since 1994, Lynn has been a member of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She's a lead author of the IPCC's second, third, fourth, and fifth assessment reports on mitigation of climate change and served as a US government expert for the sixth assessment report. Lynn has provided technical and policymaking assistance related to energy efficiency and climate change mitigation on a variety of projects to federal agencies, multilateral banks, and foundations. Nan and Lynn, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us at our briefing today. 
Thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, so in the next uh, 50 minutes, I will walk you through some um, key findings and show you where we are in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, where we're headed, and what actions we can take to limit the global warming. So, and uh, next slide, please. The reality is that the greenhouse gas emissions, which are causing global warming, are at their highest levels uh, in the human history. And Dr. Rem already and uh, uh, and it, and uh, presented that uh, in the findings from the working group one. Next, please. If you look at this chart, emissions in 2019 were about 12% uh, higher than they were in 2010 and 54% higher than in 1990. So we're not on track to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees C. Um, there are increased evidence of climate actions and and the average annual rate of growth in global emissions has actually slowed and in the last decade. So if you look at and uh, this uh, emissions um, between 2010 and uh, 2019, it actually is showing a growth rate of the emission of 1.3% per year of growth when compared with the earlier decade, uh, which is 2.1% uh, per year. And next, please. So this decline is particularly noticeable in the energy and the industry sectors where the rate of growth has more than helped. And so there are increased evidence of climate actions and I will and uh, walk you through some of those. Next, please. And um, however, despite the progress, our assessment and uh, concludes that unless there are immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, unfortunately, 1.5 degrees C is beyond reach. Next, please. Some countries um, have already achieved a steady decrease in emissions uh, over several years at a rate consistent with limiting warming to a two degrees C. And a growing number of cities are setting their net zero targets. Um, an increasing range of policies and laws have already enhanced energy efficiency, reduced the rates of deforestation, and accelerated the deployment of renewable energy and the climate laws that the result in uh, reduce or avoid emissions are present in 56 countries, covering more than half of the global emissions. Next, please. So one notable success is around the renewables. And uh, uh, if you look at this slide and showing and uh, um, the cost reduction for photovoltaics, onshore wind, and battery for passenger electric vehicles. So there have been sustained decrease in the unit costs and uh, for all, and with a reduction of 85% for solar, 55% for wind, and 85% for batteries. So in some cases, these costs have fallen below those of uh, fossil fuels. Next, please. At the same time, we've also seen a large increase in capacity installed for these and uh, renewable resources and the battery technologies, as shown in this figure. Even though and their share of the capacity in the total power generation system is still low, uh, but you can see this: uh, uh, the rate of the growth is uh, uh, astonishing. Next, please. Looking at the policies that were implemented by in December 2020, we conclude that without strengthening mitigation efforts, GG emissions are projected to lead to global warming of 3.2 degrees C. So in the scenarios we assess, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C requires global GG emissions to peak before 2025 at the latest and to be reduced by 43% by 2030, which is only eight years away. Emissions from methane, which is a short-lived but the potent greenhouse gas, would also need to be reduced by about a third over the same period. And even if we do this, it is almost inevitable that it will temporarily exceed 1.5 degrees C, but we could return to below this level of warming by the end of the century. 
Limiting the warming to uh, around 2 degrees C still requires global emissions to peak before 2025 at the latest and to be reduced by a quarter by 2030. So, um, and uh, our job is a very challenging. Next, please. Next slide. Thank you. So the temperature will stabilize when we reach the net zero carbon dioxide emissions. To limit the warming to around 1.5 degrees C requires reaching net zero carbon dioxide emissions in the early 2050s. For 2 degrees C and the emission need to be reduced to net zero in the earlier 2030s. Deep and sustained reduction of other gases would also be required. And next slide. In every sector, there are options available now and that can at least halve the emission by 2030 and keep open the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. So let's walk through this. And next, please. So in almost all chapters in uh, the working group three report and all concluded to reduce the emissions across all the sectors requires major transition, which includes the reduction of uh, overall fossil fuel use and also deployment of uh, many low emission energy sources, switching to alternative energy carriers, improve energy efficiency, and uh, to achieve more conservation. And you can see this um, and being concluded in uh, many of uh, the chapters. And uh, keep uh, clicking, please. OK, uh, next slide. The energy sector accounts for about a third of the mission, a major transition required to limit the global warming. So this will involve substantial reduction in fossil fuel use, lower no carbon energy system, widespread electrification, use of alternative fuels such as hydrogen and sustainable biofuels, and use of carbon capture and storage and improved energy efficiency. Transitioning to a low carbon energy sector is expected to cut down international trade in fossil fuels. Energy efficiency and the reductions in energy consumption can be achieved using digital technologies. In this way, it is also possible to decentralize our net energy network so the power comes from multiple localized energy networks rather than just one main electricity grid. Electricity system powered by renewables are becoming increasingly viable, but it, it will be challenging to supply the entire energy system in that way. Next slide, please. Changes to our lifestyle and behavior can reduce our carbon footprint as well as to improve our health and the well being. So there's a, uh, quite a bit of untapped potential here to bring down global emissions by between 40 and then 70 percent by 2050, um, but only if the necessary policies, the infrastructure and the technologies are all in place. Of the 60 actions and we assessed in this report, on the individual level, the biggest contribution comes from switching to walking and cycling, using electrified transport, and other effective options including reducing air travel and adapting our houses shifting toward a, a more balanced plant-based diet that is also an option. Wealthy individuals and have the highest potential for reduction as investors, consumers, role models, and our professionals. So where, while there is mitigation potential in many regions of the world, in some places, people require additional housing, energy, and resource for human well-being. To be effective, lifestyle changes will need to be supported by system changes across all as aspects of society, including transport, building, and the land use. Next slide, please. So looking at the transport sector, reducing demand plays a, a part uh, in reducing emissions, and the low-carbon technology are also key. And we all know electric vehicles offer the greatest potential as long as they're combined with low and zero carbon electricity sources. Advances in battery technologies I mentioned earlier could assist in the electrification of trucks and complement the conventional rail system. Uh, 
in aviation and shipping, which are harder to decarbonize. Alternative fuels such as low emission hydrogen and the biofuels will be needed. Overall, there's a substantial potential for emission reduction, but it depends on decarbonizing the power sector. Next, please. Cities and urban areas account for more than two thirds of global emissions. If we take into account what is produced in the city and the brought in from elsewhere, and there's significant potential for emissions reduction. In all cities, better urban planning is key, and three other broad strategies um, have been found to be effective. So these include sustainable production and consumption of goods and services, and uh, electrification, uh, sorry, it's uh, the slide of, uh, before, and it's uh, still on the city, yeah. Electrification and improving carbon urban uh, uptake and storage in cities. And for example, with the permeable surfaces, green roofs, trees, and the lakes. Next, please, on buildings. In buildings, it is possible to reach net zero in 2050. Action in this dec decade is critically and critical to fully capture the potential. It would involve retrofitting all existing buildings and use effective mitigation techniques in those that are yet to be built. So this requires ambitious policy packages, which may incorporate the use of renewables, efficient design, use of space, energy, material, and appliances. There are increasing number of zero energy and or zero carbon buildings in almost all climates. So this has uh, come and uh, about from construction and the retrofitting. More could be done to reduce emission in the sector if renovation rates and retrofitting were improved. Next, please. And the industry and, uh, is a hard to abate uh, sector. Three per approaches are under use in policies and industrial practice at the present. The basic materials, including steel and uh, uh, building material and the chemicals, low to zero uh, emission processes, are at the pilot or near commercial stage. In some cases, they're still at the commercial stage, but they're not yet established industrial practices. This sector accounts for about a quarter of global emissions. Achieving net zero will be very challenging and will require new production processes, low and zero emission electricity, hydrogen, and where necessary, even carbon capture and storage. Next slide, please. To counterbalance these hard to eliminate emissions, and for example, in the agriculture, aviation, industrial processes, we will need the carbon dioxide removal. Three methods and, uh, uh, re to remove carbon dioxide from atmosphere and stored on the land or underground or in the ocean. There are biological methods that could uh, also store carbon, such as reforestation, soil carbon management. Um, these are all widely practiced. New technologies such as the direct air capture and storage require more research, upfront investment, and proof of concept at larger scale before they can be widely used. Carbon dioxide removal is essential to achieve net zero. Next, please. Finally, agriculture, forestry, and then land use can provide large-scale emission reductions and then remove and store carbon dioxide at scale. So this can be done by protecting and restoring our natural systems, including forests, coastal wetlands, and grasslands, and improve the sustainable crop and, uh, and uh, livestock management can also play a part. Land provide, with, provide us with so much, for example, food, nature, and the feed for animals. So we also should consider these competing demands when considering and the mitigation of climate change. At the same time, land can only do so much in terms of removing and storing carbon. If we cannot use it to compensate for delayed emission reductions in other sectors. And next, please. Um, our assessment shows that the financial flows are factor of three to six times lower than the levels needed by 2030 to limit the warming to below 1.5 degrees C or two degrees C. There is actually sufficient global capital and the liquidity to close the investment gaps. And we do need a clear signaling from the government and the international community 
include a stronger uh, alignment of public sector finance and policy. They are all uh, and going to be critically important. And the one challenge for closing investment gap is uh, why it is widest for the developing countries without taking into account the economic benefits of these uh, and uh, adaptation costs or avoid the climate impact. The global GDP would be just a few percentage points lower in 2050 if we take the actions necessary to limit the warming to two degrees C or below compared to maintaining current policies. Next slide, please. So let's turn our attention now to regulatory and economic instru instruments and policies, uh, which can play a critical role in strengthening our response. So regulatory and economic instruments ranging from standards, uh, vehicle efficiency, building codes, to policies for industrial decarbonization, to broad-based carbon taxes and emissions trading system have already proven effective in reducing emissions. And such measures can be strengthened and expanded significantly. Policy packages and economic uh, and uh, packages are better able to achieve system change than individual policy instruments on their own. Next, please. And in recent years, um, there has been enormous activity, significant progress in technology and innovation, and which is also reflected in this report. I touched on a number of those earlier. Investment policies, especially and for scientific training and uh, for as well as for R&D, push forward uh, a lot of these uh, low carbon and emission technology innovation. The key to effective decision making is assessing the potential benefit and the risks for the different technology and approaches, understand their implementation at scale, and identify what stands in their way. Some options are technically viable, inc in increasingly cost effective too, and generally supported by public, which enables deployment in many regions. So those examples include the solar energy, efficient appliances, improved forest and crop management and reduce food waste. Other options face barriers that need to be addressed before they can be implemented at scale. Adoption of these technologies is slower in most develop, de developing countries, um, particularly for those least developed ones due to the limited uh, resources and the limited capacities. In all countries, uh, next please. Um, actions to limit global warming will result in wider benefits to the society and can also increase the pace, depth, and the breadth of our emission reduction. Accelerated and equitable climate action in mitigating, adapting, and the climate change impact is critical and to our sustainable development. Um, next, please, to wrap up. Climate change is a result of more than a century of unsustainable energy and land use, lifestyles, patterns of consumption and production. So this report shows how taking actions now can move us toward a fairer, more livable world. So to conclude, we know what to do and how to do it. It's up to us now. And with this, I will turn over to my colleague uh, and uh, Lynn Price and to uh, and wrap uh, this presentation up. Thank you, Don. I'd like to thank Daniel, EESI, and all of you watching for the opportunity to participate in this webinar and for your interest in this topic. Following these three presentations from the sixth assessment report, working group representatives, I'll now provide a brief look back uh, at some key IPCC milestones and findings as well as a look forward to some upcoming IPCC events. Next slide. Earlier in this webinar, Dr. Ramaswamy showed this graphic of a brief history of key IPCC milestones. So I'll just add that in 1988, uh, the IPCC was founded as a scientific body that reviews and assesses the most recent scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information produced worldwide relevant to the understanding of climate change. Currently, 195 countries are members of the IPCC. 
As Ron described, you can see the steady progression of IPCC assessment reports starting with the first assessment report in 1990 up to the sixth assessment report, which was released in 2021 and 2022. In addition, there's been a number of special reports uh, focusing on particular topics issued by the IPCC during this time. All of these reports are available on the IPCC's website. In the arrow, it's noted that there's been exponential growth in peer-reviewed literature and growing public awareness of the science of climate change during this period. The next slide focuses on one of the key areas that the IPCC has assessed over the years, the certainty associated with the influence of human activities on global climate change. At the time of the first assessment report in 1990s, when the authors reviewed a few thousand scientific peer-reviewed journal articles and other literature, they were able to state that emissions resulting from human activities are substantially increasing the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases and that these activities will enhance the greenhouse effect. Following assessment reports were able to establish a more definitive link between human activities and climate change with the second assessment report stating that these results point to a human influence on global climate, and the third assessment report finding that there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. By the fourth assessment report on the next slide, the reviewed literature led the IPCC authors to find that most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid 20th century is very likely due to observed increase in anthropogenic GHG concentrations. And by the fifth assessment report, it was found that it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Next slide. So this current sixth assessment report, which we're discussing today, draws the most definitive link between human activities and climate change, explaining that the evidence for human influence on recent climate change strengthened from the IPCC first assessment report in 1990 to the fifth assessment report in 2013 and 2014, and is now even stronger in this assessment. You can click forward, please. The authors found that human influence in the atmosphere, ocean, and land components of the climate system taken together is assessed as unequivocal for the first time in an IPCC assessment report. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, the mandate of IPCC assessment reports is to review and assess the most recent scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information produced worldwide relevant to understanding climate change. This slide shows the number of authors, the review comments, and the citations for the sixth assessment report by working group. In total, there were 782 authors who responded to nearly 200,000 review comments from experts and governments. The authors reviewed and assessed over 66,000 peer reviewed journal articles and other literature to write this assessment report. Next slide. Now, looking forward, there are two important upcoming IPCC events. First, the IPCC will hold outreach events each day at the COP27 meeting in Egypt in November. If you're going to the COP, check the IPCC's calendar for the current listing of these daily events. Second, the IPCC will release the six assessment reports synthesis report, which synthesizes the key messages from the three working group reports that you heard about today on March 20th, 2023. Next slide. And since it's Nobel Prize time, I thought I would end with a reminder that the IPCC was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundations for the measures that are needed to counteract such change. Thank you very much. And uh, for that um, extra bit of presentation, and thank you, Nan, for kicking that off. Um, I'll invite Ram and Deb and Nan to turn your cameras on, and we will move into the Q&A portion. Um, just two quick reminders. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, we still have about 25 minutes of briefing left, and so you can send us an email, ask. Uh, it's ask at esi.org. Um, and uh, 
um, you can also follow us on Twitter at ESI online. Um, and if you missed anything, you would like to go back and look at the presentation materials. Everything will be posted online at www.esi.org. And then please feel free to turn yours back on too, if you would like. We will dig in. Um, and I'd like to start um, by, you know, the, the four of you have participated in these reports. And as Lynn's presentation just described, an awful lot of collaboration and analysis and working together. And it, it feels to me a little bit like there might be a community around these reports. And Ron, maybe we'll start with you and um, Deb and Nan, and I'd like to hear from you as well. What's it like working with this global team to produce an IPCC report? What's the experience like? Are there things that sort of surprised you in this latest version? And what have you learned along the way? Ron, we'll start with you. Um, thank you, Dan, and thanks for hosting these questions. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think from uh, my perspective, uh, I'll actually pick up on something that uh, Lynn put up as the number of uh, reviewers, number of reviews, number of comments made, uh, number of articles uh, uh, cited. I mean, it's a very daunting process, and it keeps growing more and more daunting with every assessment, simply because I think as uh, Lynn showed that plot, you know, it's, everything is exponentially rising in terms of the literature and the educational aspects. So you got to assimilate all that to write an IPCC report because, uh, as I mentioned, it goes through lots of reviews. So you know, you, you can't be slacking off on it. So that's very daunting, just the sheer number of uh, items you have to take into account. I think in this particular uh, AR6, uh, what I found to be quite different uh two two things were different one was the pandemic uh, you know it created a difference in the sense that uh, we could not have uh, meetings in person which previous ipccs did which made for a lot of uh, useful interactions instead we had to almost contrive as to how to do meetings effectively on you know through the electronic media zoom or google microsoft and that that was very challenging because uh, in the, in particular the chapter that i was involved with uh, there were literally authors all the way from Australia to, uh, you know, across the, uh, I don't know, the farthest you can think of, uh, Canada. And to accommodate everyone, you had to kind of get everyone together and then to find a time when people, I mean, it was just sheer madness sometimes because uh, people were sometimes being called up to work from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. on chapters. So that was daunting that was due to the pandemic. But the other thing that I think was very interesting, and I don't know if the authors in the other working groups noticed it, but I noticed for the first time, or not for the first time necessarily, but maybe in a more enhanced sense, the connection to climate extremes that people were feeling in different parts of the world. So it was not just you know the usual thing like the globe is warming, but really much more regional level uh, events and information such as you know droughts or heavy precipitation or uh, you know the glaciers melting locally those were actually the, the topics that i would say connected uh, everyone much more closely this time because from every region uh, every corner of the globe uh, of the inhabited globe was seeing extremes and so that made for a different kind of connection in terms of just writing the you know in the working group one context in terms of writing out the assessment, it, it made for a lot of, uh, uh, you know, not only awareness, but engagement by people from different parts of the world, which I thought was very telling for the whole assessment. Deb and Nan, please feel free to offer any perspectives from where you're Sure, yeah. So I share a lot of uh, what Ram also uh, experienced um, in terms of uh, and uh, the challenges and uh, working with the different time zones and the people from different culture um, and almost everybody's from a different country. And, uh, and also what, what I found a very interesting uh, and uh, as a, a first 
and uh, time uh, author for the IPCC is people come from very different disciplinary. And that probably is a part of uh, um, and by design uh, for the IPCC different chapters. Um, and uh, I'm more used to working with uh, colleagues in my own and field more on technologies, uh, more on policy that can promote technologies. But at uh, this uh, chapter author meeting, we I found that there are many other economists, social scientists, and uh, people from very different field, and they bring very new perspective. And for example, um, and when uh, we we talk about uh, and, uh, advancing the deployment of technology and the social scientists will bring up these just transition issues um, and how can we have equitable and the transition and we need to consider and training and education and ensuring the well-being of these uh, for example uh, coal mines that will be face down or face out um, and uh, so the sectors will be affected and then also considering and uh, some of uh, ecosystem and the damages impact. So those are uh, a very and uh, interesting and the rewarding experience. It was challenging during pandemics, uh, getting up uh, four, uh, four thirty, and to be in the five a.m. calls to accommodate. Unfortunately, U.S. is uh, and uh, the the time zone we have, we, we sort of have to accommodate for um, and others. So, but but it's also rewarding because of the challenging um, and. Uh, uh, also being able to work online and spreading what is supposed to be a whole day meeting right into many different small segments like every morning uh, two hours and uh, so um, but that, that was a quite a and a fascinating experience um, yeah yeah I'll just um, say that starting from 1.5 you know it was the special report on 1.5 was special in many reasons. One, it was the first time that it was requested by the COP parties, you know, by, by the member states specifically, but also it was the first report that brought the three working groups together. So that was challenging in that the natural and social scientists from the three working groups hadn't worked together before, but I think it brought really rich um, discussions and, you know, how to, include equity and justice ethics considerations into as non mentioned technologies but um also how you know social scientists could better um integrate these considerations with the uh, you know with what natural scientists were saying and then myself being an engineer just kind of added another i would say hiccup because i'm not natural or social scientist but um it I think there's an openness from all the experts to hear from from others, and I think right now with the with AR6 was different, of course, because of the pandemic, as Ram and Nan um, mentioned. And um, for your second part of your question about surprising um, findings or such, I think that in working group two, the fact that the SPM we got to mention that colonialism is one of the main causes of vulnerability, I think it was huge. You know, because when we talk about how we do these transformations, like transformational adaptation, that involves addressing the root causes of vulnerability, you know, we know what to focus on. The fact that, you know, equity and justice and ethics and inclusion got such a big focus um, under climate resilient development pathways. The fact that we included, um, like, the provision of basic services and infrastructure, like rural electrification and rural water and sanitation, as a means for adaptation opens up a huge new finance, um, you know, financing sources that now funding that traditionally is for um, rural development or poverty alleviation can also be used for adaptation. So I think there are many positive things and um, together with the, the new research we have on loss and damage. But I know that that's the focus for your for another talk. Thank you. Yes, we'll have a whole briefing just about that topic. It's a, a, an enormous issue. Um, and last year we did one sort of specific on international climate finance too, and those are obviously, you know, it, those topics are inextricably related. Um, I, Lynn, you unmuted, please feel free to go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, as a person who participated in earlier assessment reports, but not in this one, I um, cannot imagine how difficult it must have been to work in um, the under the conditions of the pandemic for these authors. It, normally you get together for a week and 
you're not just with your author team, but you are working in a number of cross-cutting issues across author teams, which meant that these folks had to have Zoom calls, not just with their authors, but you know their co-authors of their chapter, um, but also with many others. And uh, you know it's a, a very dynamic process of going back and forth. And I'd also like to point out that when I mentioned there were oh, almost 200,000 review comments, there is a review editor for each chapter that ensures that each review comment is responded to. So it's not just that the authors read them and re responding to them in person in a group to you know, brainstorm with your colleagues is one thing, but doing it you know, over the internet and, and by Zoom, I think must have been very challenging this year, especially because there were more, many more review comments for this assessment report than for previous ones. Well, thanks for indulging that question. I think it's really interesting the amount of, you know, this isn't this isn't some machine output, right? This is the result of a ton of hard work over many, many years and really compelling analysis. And so thanks for indulging that question. Um, Deb, I'm gonna start with you for this next question. Um, and and we're we got a couple questions uh from our audience too that that kind of start to get at this issue. And I'm curious, you know, the report is broken up into three working groups. Um, and we'll start with you, but I'll invite everyone else to offer comments too. What do you see as the main linkages across the working groups? Are there common threads that you would point out to our audience that appear in multiple um, multiple reports? Yeah, well, um, as uh, was mentioned before, the topic of extremes um, has come across in working group two. And of course, we rely on the information of working group two also for the the part of impacts and risks that working group two deals with. I, um, the interactions I've had mainly was with working group three starting in 1.5, which again brought all of us um, together, which was I think very, very useful. Um, and that continued in, in, in AR6 with the feasibility assessment, because um, when looking at what adaptations we can, what options we can use to reduce risks, we also have to see that we don't significantly significantly increase um, emissions, but also look at what options came from working group three that could significantly increase um, risks. So for example, provide more competition with land or water use like um, carbon um, carbon capture and, and, and storage. So um, the, the, the specific part that I'm discussing um, appeared in working group two in chapter 18, but it was actually a cross working group effort. We had about 20 working group three authors working with another working group two team and looking option per option of, you know, all the options considered in each of the two working groups. And then that we could then present these um, results as what is, what is the best that we have available that can meet um, you know, the mitigation adaptation and help advance the sustainable development goals. But I think that these um, conversations, these messages are increasingly important and that the working groups really can't be as isolated as saying, well, this is my territory or this is just only for me to discuss because there really is a linkage, especially, you know, when working group three talks about um, their sustainable um, development pathways or climate resilient development, it's how you actually um, bring together, and sorry if I mangled the name of the working group three, um, sustainable development pathways. Thank you. Um, no, no, please go ahead. I just so very quickly add as a again a first time freshman for the IPC report writing, um, and. Uh, at least for our chapter and uh, uh, we included the adaptation and risk assessment and I think it's a uh, uh, included for almost all chapter for uh, the working groups uh, three report writing and I can give you example for some of these linkages uh, for example uh, I mentioned about alternative uh, fuel and cleaner fuel biofuel right a lot of those are coming from and uh, and uh, kind of our agriculture and uh, uh, 
plants or crops and all of those. And so some of them are competing with our food system, right? So that's the area we need to consider. And so the mitigation and the impact potentially um, and uh, uh, for uh, the food system, and then also uh, linking to some adaptation. And adaptation could also mean, for example, improving our resilience uh, in extreme climate events, such as um, and uh, flooding, a drought, or wildfire. Uh, and so in, in some of those areas, uh, can we build houses in the way they're more adapted to those extreme events? Um, and can we build our power system and that's uh, also more resilient, either under wiring or uh, put some of those uh, lines up uh, so it can um, be still functioning when there's flood. And, and there's also extreme weather events such as snowstorm in Texas and or somewhere um, else. And uh, so in those situations, we have to um, and have more distributed system and not just counting on a one centralized and power plant uh, and uh, grid. And so, so combination diverse energy uh, sources concerning those storage and is another way for us to uh, adapt and to the future climate change. Thanks. Go ahead. Did you have something? I'm happy to let you chime in. This is can I, can I just to add a make a point. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of add that. Uh, being involved in working group one, uh, one of the things that uh, led off from working group one and then cascaded to the other working groups was the uh, notion of hydrological extremes, namely the heavy precipitation or lack of it. Um, that one, um, you know, there's a lot of information now that we have from both observations and the model simulations that then uh, kind of plays into this concept of the environmental intelligence where for water security and also also food security, energy security, the uh, understanding of the uncertainties in the precipitation and therefore the extremes in hy hydrological cycle uh, become an important part of the whole process of both adaptation as well as uh, mitigation. And it further showed, so showed up in the context of the sea level rise, particularly in the special report on uh, SROC, the sp uh, special report on oceans and cryosphere. It kind of traced all the way from warming to sea level rise to regional coastal inundation and then affecting uh, communities down to tribal communities in different parts of the world. So I, so that kind of linkage is uh, what I've observed, you know, growing in IPCC over the different assessments and this one in this particular one, as well as the short reports, um, it manifests itself really uh, very nicely as a linkage across the the, the framework under which the three group working groups uh, are operating. Thanks. We're going to shift gears just a little tiny bit, and we're going to go into a lightning round. Um, and this question comes to us uh, from our audience. Uh, given the sense of urgency that the sixth assessment report conveys, and I think urgency is definitely one of the key themes um, when you when you when you read the report. Um, I'm asking each one of our panelists if they could offer maybe one to two of the most important actions we could take to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate impacts, given sort of where you see things, um, uh, you know, per the report. Um, happy to let anyone go first, but um, definitely would like to hear from all the panelists if you're if you have one or two things to offer. Go ahead, Deb. Right, so I'll start now. I, I'd say that first one is. Um, nature-based solution, including nature um, throughout, you know, land systems, energy, urban, um, and also the part of um, justice, equity, and ethics. I think that those considerations need to be at the center of all options. So it's not just the option or, or the, the technology or the institutions, it's about the people. Thank you. Yeah, I can uh, go next. Uh, so on the mitigation side, um, I think it's worth exploring, as was pointed out in the assessment, there are uh, gases other than CO2, which are also being responsible for the, uh, the whole greenhouse gas, greenhouse effect. 
And in that context, methane is kind of a very stark example. There's also black carbon in terms of uh, particulates. And there are numerous you know, calculations which were kind of also presented to the IPCC where just um, reducing them uh, would contribute towards improving the situation of how much uh, the Earth's energy is out of balance. On the adaptation side, there are clear indications now where you can actually begin to think of uh, some regions which are going to be more highly sensitive to warming and other extremes. And it might be useful to consider uh, paying more attention to those regions to um, maybe uh, afford them a greater opportunity to protect assets, preserve assets, and they might, there might be some early warning signs in some of these regions of uh, tipping points. So if, uh, if some attention could be paid, paid there, um, it might actually be sort of a advancement in terms of an, you know, some investment coming along good in terms of adaptation. Thanks. Um, I'll start and then I'll let Nan provide the details. The big picture is we need to decarbonize the grid with more renewables and that means a, also a focus on storage. And then we need a lot more electrification and I'll turn it over to Nan for some details on that area. Um, so I think it's my own interpretation. Um, I think that really we need a system solutions, right? And uh, so our report pointed out to hundreds of uh, thousands of measures we can take. Um, but uh, taking the each kind of one by one, it has been so slow. Um, and uh, also we, we're not just uh, and uh, getting the speed and the scale we need uh, for this transition. And then so the report identified the area for material efficiency, energy efficiency, and the recycle reuse and um, new alternative source of electrification, all of those. And how, how can we kind of uh, and uh, deploy these as a system? And uh, so they can be replicated more largely. So I've been thinking a lot more on that. Um, and so just to give an example for buildings, uh, the way we've been building buildings, um, it's a, almost uh, pretty much the same from 100 years ago, so 70 years ago. This industry and has shown very low productivity. And we have, we're also facing housing crisis. And uh, um, there's uh, all these other equity and affordable housing development and all these other objectives that we have to meet. So this um, area of industry construction uh, used to be called the prefabricate building offers a very good vehicle and to so we make all the parts use the best and uh, available uh, windows insulation walls ceiling and everything put this all uh, together in the, uh, and in the factory. And so they can, we can build in a higher quality and assemble it on site. And so this way we can as, uh, assemble it in two weeks instead of we spending a whole year, build a whole house, right? For a large high rise building, it may take us two, three years with this method, we can do it in, in a month or two months. Other countries have shown and they can do that. And so, um, and then also when we do that, we'll be able to make sure everything's right and uh, we can do it much faster and uh, three, four times faster and at a lower cost. And in this area, actually, U.S. and can also leapfrog and uh, call it modernizing our construction industry. And we use we can use a, a low carbon building material, low carbon cement, low carbon um, and uh, concrete, steel, and also uh, in recycled, reuse all of uh, and just deliver the house as a one product instead of getting one window and uh, all the equipment to to be put in. So this area, I think. Uh, and some countries already uh, and developed further, more advanced. I think the U.S. has a lot of potential and to address our uh, various uh, objectives. And I just also give an example, um, Denmark in the uh, many years ago invested in the wind solar when it was very expensive. And but now today they are the world biggest producer. Right, and exporting all these wind turbines everywhere. And so we have all the great talents, we have all the resources, and uh, we can actually uh, also advance in this area. Great, I love that example of the prefabricated construction and 
I'd probably toss mass timber and uh, wood construction into that list as well. We have time for one last one. Um, Ram, I think we may start with you on this and then open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, but um, there, we've talked about the sixth assessment report, but for our congressional audience thinking you know, about sort of this from a domestic perspective, there's also uh, the national climate assessment that the United States government carries out. And I'm curious sort of what the relationship is between these two efforts do, are they complementary? Are they different? Are they? Do they have the same scope? What's the schedule like? Just, just to this will probably have to be the last one um, of our session today. But just like to get a little clarity around that issue. Yeah, I, I try to ask that quickly. So many of the authors that are, that are, they are similar. I mean, they, 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 are, they are same authors. But what the the, the, the complementarity is that all the results in IPCC are actually used by the National Climate Assessment. The National Climate Assessment goes further into more US specific issues and more, and you will find it more sort of region specific around the United States or around North America. And so that's the major difference. And a lot of, I mean, whether it's uh, not just the science, but also the adaptation aspects, vulnerabilities, uh, mitigation aspects, it, it goes more comprehensively through these other issues. That's the main sort of uh, standout about the National Climate Assessment compared to the IPCC report. Otherwise, Everything that's in the IPCC report, because it's well peer reviewed, it's actually accepted for reporting in the National Climate Assessment. So our congressional staff audience should see both of them as you know different different sources of information, but you know one just has a uh, more of a national focus and the other is broader. They're not there's there shouldn't be any inconsistencies or um, any confusion between the two reports. Great, thank you. We. This is so hard. We have four panelists and we could just keep going on and on. Not I could listen to you talk to you about building listen to you talk about buildings all day. But alas, our 90 minutes are up and we have to um, let our audience go about the rest of their business. But um, thank you so much to our tremendous panelists, Ram, Deb, Nan, uh, and Lynn. Thank you for being fantastic panelists. Thank you for making such great presentations. Um, folks who weren't able to join us today during our online audience will have the ability to go back and watch your presentations and review your um, uh, presentation materials as well. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, congratulations on um, all of the efforts uh, that you contributed to the six assessment report and Lynn, in your case, previous editions uh, as well. Thanks so much um, for all of that. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to say thanks to my ESI colleagues who made today's briefing possible, uh, starting with Dan O'Brien, but also Henri Laporte, Emma, uh, Allison, Anna, Savannah, and Molly, uh, a really great team effort. Um, this is the first of four COP briefings, um, and uh, they uh, were really, really excited about the, all the issues we'll be covering. We'll be looking at nature-based solutions or natural climate solutions. We'll be looking at loss and damage. We'll be looking at the negotiations themselves, the process. Um, and uh, my colleague just put up uh, some uh, some dates and times here. If you haven't yet RSVP'd for those briefings, uh, you can do that by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Um, you can also uh, sign up for our newsletters, including um, our daily COP27 newsletter, COP27 dispatch that uh, will um, uh, be coming out every afternoon-ish uh, during uh, COP27 as well. Um, also like to give a quick shout out to our three fall interns, Alina, Shreya, and Nick, who are awesome and uh, will be helping with the summary notes uh, and are writing articles and will help us keep everything moving ahead uh, while um, covering COP27. Uh, my colleague just put up uh, a survey slide. Uh, if you have two minutes and uh, would like to share your feedback of today's session, uh, did you have any audio problems, video problems, ideas for future topics, uh, anything like that? Um, please feel free to, to share um, your, your feedback in the survey responses. We read every response uh, and we really appreciate it when folks in our audience take a few minutes to share what they thought. Um, we will go ahead and wrap it there and we will be back uh, next week. Uh, Dano, can you go back one real quick? We'll be back on the 20th for climate change, loss and damage, the 28th for natural climate solutions and then November 2nd, right before Anna and I take off for Egypt, uh, what's on the table for the negotiations. You can go forward now. Um, so we've got some really great briefings coming up and uh, thanks for joining us. Sorry for going a couple minutes over, but um, we'll see you next week for climate change, loss and damage. Thanks.